Good Bread Basket Monday. We are going to take a look at the cookbook that I got from the Greene County Library and see if we can pull out a really good recipe. I think I found a really tasty one. And here we go. For those of you who saw the library episode already, you'll know that this one was coming in next. Um, I kind of have mixed feelings about this cookbook, but I won't get into that until after we've kind of gotten this one at least started. So let me go ahead and show you the recipe. Now the picture did have a lot to do with my choosing this. Look how awesome and good those look. I cannot wait. We are going to be doing a potato dinner roll. They promise that it's the potato that really makes this recipe awesome and tasty. This has a fairly short rise time, so I think we'll be able to get these out fairly quickly. Now, I have already gone ahead and peeled and diced the potato and got it started boiling. These actually should be soft and ready to go ahead uh, and use, but we are gonna need to reserve some of that liquid. So I've got my bowl here, these are done. So I'm gonna go ahead and take out five tablespoons of this liquid, put it in here, and we will reserve this for a later time into the mixing process. So I'm gonna finish that, drain these, and show you the next step. Now you see that I've got that drained. Now according to the cookbook, we need to put it on low heat and evaporate some of that liquid that's in the pan. So they said to give it a shake occasionally and make sure you get that liquid out of the pan before we go on to the next step. All right, I've got the liquid evaporated out, so I'm just gonna take my potato masher, give these a quick mash. You can also use a potato ricer if you have one, but this works just as good. Now I'm going to pack as much as I can into this one cup measuring cup, and then we will melt our butter in it. All right, I've got my packed potatoes that's going into the bowl, and then we will be melting this uh, two tablespoons of butter in it. And I'm actually trying something new. This is a uh, dairy-free plant butter, but it promises to bake just like butter. So we will find out, I guess. Now, I only had a little bit of potatoes left over. They said, you know, obviously you could save that for another use. I'm just gonna butter and salt it and just eat it as a snack while I'm waiting for the bread to rise. <laughs> Now we're gonna set that to the side and let that cool down. In the meantime, I'm going to pull this big boy out and I will get the flour and yeast and things like that started. So let's go ahead and get that done so we can hurry up and get some potato rolls. All right, I've got my stand mixer bowl. I've already put my two and a quarter cups of flour in the bowl and now I'm just going to add the yeast and our salt. We're gonna whisk that together and that's gonna be ready for the next step now. But first, we need to add some things to our potato water. So into this potato water is gonna go one egg and a tablespoon of sugar. Now we're gonna whisk all this together until the sugar is dissolved. And now here's where it's gonna get really messy. So we've got our flour mixture, and then we've also got our mashed potatoes with the butter. We're gonna add this to this bowl. And then we're gonna use our hands <laughs> to mix this all in. Now the recipe said don't worry if it's lumpy, just make sure you get it all mixed in there. And now we can wash our hands and add this to our stand mixer for the next step. 
All right, now we're gonna slowly add this egg and potato cooking water mixture to this flour and get it mixed up. Now, the recipe actually said to let this go for about eight minutes to let that actually start kneading it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, get my dishes done while I let this run in the background. And when we come back, this should be a beautiful workable dough. All right, got some things cleaned up while this thing was noisily going on in the background, and I think we're actually there. Now, this looks a little concerning, um, you know, that is kind of stuck there, but according to the cookbook, you do actually want it to clear the sides of the bowl, but sticks to the bottom. And that's exactly what we have, so we should be good to go to the next step. And we're all ready for the next step. I've got my bowl greased and ready. So we're just gonna lightly flour this and then knead our dough a little bit longer. Now this is gonna be just about 30 seconds, just enough to go ahead and make a nice little ball out of it. You want the seam side down. We will put this in our greased bowl, cover it with a cloth and I will be putting it in my oven to keep warm. Now you see I've got my oven light on that actually provides quite a bit of little warmth for a uh, rising bread. So I'm gonna shove it into the corner next to that light. And now we just have to wait one hour for that to double in size. <laughs> And by the way, my oven was a little bit warm still from having made breakfast this morning from this little cookbook that we got from the library. If some of you watched the Friday's episode, you'll know that we made a wonderful nacho dinner out of this. But this morning we made these breakfast nachos and they were phenomenal. It was a new favorite breakfast for us and one that's going to go into uh, the breakfast rotation. And now while that's rising in the oven, let's go ahead and take a look at why I kind of have mixed feelings for this particular cookbook. Now, I think sometimes you can be a hit or miss almost with America's Test Kitchen because they have access to a lot of equipment and professional kitchen um, that you probably don't have access to. I know I don't. Um, and so sometimes their recipes seem to get a little bit overly complicated. And that's where I think this particular cookbook kind of went in that direction. Now, I'm not saying that about the entire book. There are things in here that look fairly simple, don't require a lot of rise time, um, you know, don't really need a whole lot of babysitting in the kitchen. And so, yeah, you can get some really good recipes out of here. Now, I actually had a little bit of a hard time picking what I wanted to do out of this cookbook because this, for example, looks really good, except for the fact that you actually need 24 hours to make this. Total time is 27 hours to make this uh, particular recipe. Now, that is, you know, putting this in your refrigerator or letting it rise overnight. So yeah, you don't have a whole lot of hands-on work, um, but if you're like me and your refrigerator is kind of uh, <laughs> stuffed, you might not have room to put a large bowl or a entire sheet pan of bread in your refrigerator. Now, I thought this looked actually uh, pretty good too, but you'll see we've got 27 and a quarter hours all together that we would need to make um, for this bread. And for a lot of people, you just don't have that kind of time. I mean, sometimes it's really hard to, you know, devote even a morning or, you know, like the three to four hours that some of this bread takes to make, let alone uh, devote 27 hours to it. Now, there were a lot of really neat techniques in here, like you learn how to braid dough and make it really pretty. You also have lots of really cool techniques like this where you're literally braiding, um, you know, cinnamon and sugar into a bread. I bet that would be really good. 
And here we have something else that uh, was a little bit surprising to me. Now, you'll notice that several of the recipes in this chapter actually requires two plates of lava rocks. Yes, you heard me correctly. You need to buy lava rocks in order to make this particular bread and a lot of the other ones in this chapter, which also requires you to babysit that and, you know, add water because you're trying to steam this bread um, and create like this nice crust to it. Some of them also require, you know, large uh, aluminum roasting pans and other specialized equipment. You know, something that I typically would not keep in my kitchen because, you know, I mean, are we going to really be using a lot of this, um, you know, for other things? It's kind of just taking up room in your cabinets at that point. And that's why I'm overall torn on this particular cookbook. I think it's well done. I think it teaches you a lot of really nice techniques. However, um, there's, you know, equipment and things like lava rocks um, that I really don't want to store in my kitchen, taking up room for just the occasional bread that I might need it for. Therefore, I'm really glad that I picked this particular cookbook up at my library instead of going ahead and buying it on Amazon like I had been planning to do because now I see that I probably won't be using that cookbook very often. Now, America's Test Kitchen does have another one. I'll try to find a picture and pop it up here so that you can see what that looks like. It's 100 easy breads to make. So we'll see if that one's a little bit more accessible, especially for someone who may need to be careful about how much equipment they've got stored in their kitchen for lack of space or just quite simply lack of time. So there you go. I would say get this from the library, have some fun with it, learn a new technique, um, but maybe not buy it unless you're absolutely going to become an artisanal bread home chef. Otherwise, you're probably not gonna find a whole lot in here that you may be able or have time to do. It's been an hour, so let's check on our bread. Ooh, <laughs> and I would say that is ready. Oh, it feels good. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and go to the next step and get these ready for, yes, a second rise. <laughs> All right, now this gets stretched, it said, into a 12 inch log. So oh, let's try to work on that. <laughs> And then we're going to cut this into 12 equal pieces. So I guess we'll start about here and work our way down. One. All right, now I got 11, um, but some of these was a little bit longer than others. So I think I might go ahead and pinch off some of these to make them a little bit more equal and then make our 12 all together. Okay, I'm gonna call that uh, 12 and relatively even. And we will go ahead and roll these up. Cover the ones you're not working with with saran wrap. And it's said to form them into a ball by kind of stretching and moving the seam side down. And they said make sure you pinch the bottoms together to make the top relatively smooth. And we're going to do that with each one of them. So let me go ahead and I'll get that done. And then we will move on to what we do next. Oh, I am so excited because we have a tray of rolls that looks really, really close to the professional chef's tray of rolls. So I think these are going to look really good once they're baked. However, 
We don't get to bake them yet. We now have to put them under saran wrap. And these are gonna go in my slightly warm oven to raise for another possible hour. They may be done in 30 minutes, we'll check them. However, we've got some more waiting time to do regardless. So we're gonna go ahead and let that rise and then we will finally be able to bake them into this beautiful golden brownness. And it's time to check these for a second time and oh, I think we're ready. Oh my gosh, these look beautiful. I think these are ready to bake. Now that one looks a little bit janky, but that was my first one. So, you know, the rest of them look really good. So we'll just concentrate on these and pretend uh, that one didn't happen. But we're gonna go ahead and preheat the oven and then get our egg wash ready to brush and then bake them. I've already got the tablespoon of water in here. We're just gonna put a pinch of salt we will beat that together and then we will just gently brush this egg wash on top of each roll. And we are ready to pop them in the oven for a third and final time. These will bake for about 12 to 14 minutes and halfway through, I will rotate the pan to do like more of an even bake on them. And then we should be ready for our taste test. I think they're done. Oh my gosh. That is near to perfect a roll as I've ever made. <laughs> and now the very hard part is going to be waiting for these to cool down somewhat so we can actually try them. All right, they're cool enough to touch, so let's break one open and see the inside. Oh, wow, look how good that looks. Almost like a professional roll from an actual bakery. So let's go ahead and try it and see uh, how good this actually is. All right, time to actually try. Very good very savory. I'm actually really surprised by that. And what I mean by savory is it's actually saltier than I thought it would be. So if you're one of those that likes a slightly sweeter dinner roll, this is more of a bit of a salty roll that you dip in soup and let it soak up uh, the broth and have a good bite with it. Now, would I say that this was worth the work? I'm not really sure because I happen to be one of those that prefers a little bit of a sweeter dinner roll. <laughs> so that's just my personal preference. I probably would not actually make these again. Um, however, they do taste good. Um, but like I said, I tend to kind of skew on the sweeter side um, of dinner rolls. And so this isn't probably something that I would put that amount of work into um, to make again. Now, like I said earlier, this is not a cookbook that I'm going to be buying. It will be going back to the library and staying there because I have no interest in buying lava rocks and going into a 27 hour uh, baking spree with some of these loaves of bread. But if you are an adventurous bread baker and you really want to take your bread baking to a new level, um, basically an artisanal level, then I would say there are some really cool techniques in here that you would really be interested in learning. 
So thank you for watching this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it kind of inspires you to check out your local libraries and see what's going on inside because you never know quite what books they might have that's going to help you out and possibly give you some really, really good dinner ideas to boot. And stay tuned because we have more libraries we're going to be going to. So I'm excited for that to see what they have in their collection. And thank you for watching this episode. We will see you later. Bye. And if you like historical cooking and unusual cookbooks, here's two more videos you might enjoy. And make sure to like and subscribe for more foodie adventures.